Welcome to my book nook. Welcome back to my book nook. And holy cow, that last reading, that was something. We are reading The Help by Catherine Stockett. I hope that you are enjoying it as much as I am. I mean, you can always see the movie, but the book is, I'm telling you friends, every time it's going to be better. Every time. Let's go ahead and get started. We are on chapter 27 and it's called Miss Skeeter. I stare at the phone in the kitchen. No one's called here in a long time. In so long, it's like a dead thing mounted to the wall. There's a terrible quiet lumen everywhere. At the library, at the drugstore where I pick up mother's medicine. On High Street where I buy typewriter ink, even in our house. President Kennedy's assassination less than two weeks ago has struck the world dumb. It's like no one wants to be the first to break the silence. Nothing seems important enough. On the rare occasion that the phone does ring lately, it's Dr. Neal calling with more bad test results or a relative check-in on mother. And yet, I still think Stuart, some, think Stuart sometimes, even though it's been five months since he's called. Even though I finally broke down, told mother we'd broken up. Mother looked shocked, as I suspected she would, but thankfully she just sighed. I take a deep breath, dial zero, and close myself up in the pantry. I tell the local operator the long-distance number and wait. Harper and Rowe Publishers, how may, I con how may I help you? How may I connect you? Lane Stein's office, please. I wait for her secretary to come online, wishing I'd done this earlier, but it felt wrong to call the week of Kennedy's death, and I heard off the, on the news most offices were closed. Then it was Thanksgiving week, and when I called, the switchboard told me no one was answering in their office at all, so now I'm calling more than a week later than I had planned. Elaine Stein... I blink, surprised it's not her secretary. Mrs. Stein, I, I'm sorry, this is Eugenia Phelan in Jackson, Mississippi. Yes, Eugenia, she sighs, evidently irritated that it took the chance that she took the chance to answer her own phone. I was calling to let you know that the manuscript will be ready right after the new year. I'll be mailing it to you the second week of January. I smile, having delivered my rehearsed lines perfectly. There's silence except for an exhale of cigarette smoke. I shift on the flower can. I'm the one writing about the, I'm I'm the one writing about the colored women, in Mississippi. Yes, I remember. She says, but I I can't tell if she really does. But then she says, you're the one who applied for the senior position. How's that project going? It's almost finished. We just have two more interviews to complete, and I was wondering if I should send it directly to your attention or to your secretary. Oh, no. January is not acceptable. Eugenia, are you in the house? I hear Mother call. I cover the phone. Just a minute, Mama. I call back, knowing if I don't, she'll barge in here. The last editor's meeting of the year is on December 21st, Mrs. Stein continues. If you want a chance... Uh, at getting this red eye, I've got to have it in my hands by then. Otherwise, it goes in the pile. You don't want to be in the pile, Miss Fallon. But you told me January. Today is December 2nd, and that only gives me 19 days to finish the entire thing. December 21st is when everyone leaves for vacation, and then in the new year, we've deluged, we're have deluged we deluged with products from our own list of authors and journalists. If you're a nobody, as you are, Miss Fallon, before the 21st is your window, your only window. I swallow. I, I don't know if... By the way, was that your mother you were speaking to? Do you still live at home? I try to think of a lie. She's just visiting, she's sick, she's passing through, because I do not want Mrs. Stein to know that I've done nothing with my life. But then I say, yes, I still live at home. And the Negro woman who raised you, I'm assuming she's still there? No, she's gone. Mm, too bad. Do you know what happened to her? It's just occurred to me you'll need a section about your own maid. I close my eyes, fighting frustration. I don't know, honestly. Well, find out. Definitely get that in. It'll add something personal to all this. 
Yes, ma'am, I say, even though I have no idea how I'll finish two maids in time, much less write stories about Constantine. Just the thought of writing about her makes me wish deeply that she was here now. Goodbye, Miss Philon. I hope you make the deadline, she says before she hangs up, she mutters. And for God's sake, you're a 24-year-old educated woman. Go get an apartment. I get off the phone, stunned by the news of the deadline and Mrs. Stein's insistence to get Constantine in the book. I know I need to get to work immediately, but I check on Mother in her bedroom. In the past three months, her ulcers have gotten much worse. She's lost more weight, can't even get through two days without vomiting. Even Dr. Neal looked surprised when I brought her in for the appointment last week. Mother eyes me up and down from her bed. Don't you have bridge club today? It's canceled. Lisbeth's baby is colicky. I lie. So many times have been told the room is thick with them. <laughs> How are you feeling? I ask. The old white enamel bowl is next to her on the bed. You been sick? I'm fine. Don't wrinkle your forehead like that, Eugenia. It's not good for your complexion. Mother still doesn't know that I've been kicked out of bridge club or that Patsy Joyner got a new tennis partner. I don't get invited to cocktail parties or baby showers anymore or any functions where Hilly will be there, except for the league. At meetings, girls are short to the point with me when discussing newsletter business. I try to convince myself I don't care. I fix myself at my typewriter and I don't leave most days. I tell myself that's what you get when you are thirty. You put 31 toilets on the most popular girl's front yard. People tend to treat you a little differently than before. It was almost four months ago that the door was sealed shut between Hilly and me and a door made of ice so thick it would take a hundred Mississippi summers to melt it. It's not as if I hadn't expected consequences. I just had, hadn't thought they'd last so long. Hilly's voice over the phone was gravelly, sounding low, like she'd been yelling all morning. You are sick, she hissed at me. Do not speak to me. Do not look at me. Do not say hello to my children. Technically, it was a typo, Hilly, was all I could think to say. I'm going over to Senator Whitworth's house myself and telling him you, Skeeter Felon, will be a blight on his campaign in Washington. A war on the face of his reputation if Stuart ever associates with you again. I cringed at the mention of his name, even though we'd been broken up for weeks by then. I could imagine him looking away, not caring what I did anymore. You turned my yard into some kind of a sideshow. Hill had said. Just how long have you been planning to humiliate my family? What Healy didn't understand was I hadn't planned it at all. When I started typing out her bathroom initiative for the newsletter, typing words like disease and protect yourself and you're welcome, it was like something cracked open inside of me. Not unlike a watermelon, cool and soothing and sweet. I always thought insanity would be a dark, bitter feeling, but it is a drenching and delicious thing if you really roll around in it. I'd packed Pascagoula's brother, brothers. I'd paid Pascagoula's brothers twenty-five dollars each to put those junkyard pots onto Hilly's lawn. They were scared, but willing to do it. I remember how dark the night had been. I remember feeling lucky that some old building had been gut gutted, and there were so many toilets at the junkyard to choose from. Twice I've dreamed I was back there doing it again. I don't regret it, but I don't feel quite as lucky anymore. And you call yourself a Christian, were Hilly's final words to me, and I thought, God, when did I ever do that? This November, Stooley Whitworth won the senator's race for Washington, but William Holbrook lost the local election to take his state seat. I'm quite sure Hilly blames me for this, too, not to mention all that work she put in to set me up with Stuart was for nothing. Few hours after talking to Mrs. Stein over the phone, I tiptoe back to check on Mother one last time. Dad is already asleep beside her. Mother has a glass of milk on the table. She's propped up on the pillows, but her eyes are closed. She opens them as I'm peeking in. Can I get you anything, Mother? I'm only resting because Dr. Neal told me to. Where are you going, Eugenia? It's nearly seven o'clock. I'll be back in a little while. Just going for a drive. I give her a kiss, hoping she don't ask me any more questions. When I close the door, she's already fallen asleep. I drive fast through town. I dread telling Abilene about the new deadline. The old truck rattles and bangs in the potholes. It's in fast decline after another hard cotton season. My head practically hits the ceiling every time someone tied the seat springs too tight. I have to drive with the window down, my arm hanging out so the door won't rattle. 
The front window has a new smash in it in the shape of a sunset. I'll pull up to a light on State Street across from the paper company, and when I look over, there's Lisbeth and May Mobley and Raleigh, all crammed in the front seat of their white Corvair, headed home from supper somewhere, I guess. I freeze, not daring to look over again, afraid she'll see me and ask what I'm doing in the truck. I let them drive ahead, watching their taillights, fighting a hotness rising in my throat. It's been a long time since I've talked to Elizabeth. After the toilet incident, Elizabeth and I struggled to stay friends. We still talked on the phone occasionally, but she stopped saying more than a hello and a few empty sentences to me at league meetings because Hilly would see her. The last time I stopped by Elizabeth's house was a month ago. I can't believe how big May Mobley's gotten, I'd say. May Mobley had smiled shyly, hid behind her mother's legs. She was taller but still soft with baby fat. Growing like a weed, Elizabeth said, looking out the window, and I thought, what an odd thing to compare your child to. A weed. Elizabeth was still in her bathrobe, hair rollers in, already tiny again after the pregnancy. Her smile stayed tight. She kept looking at her watch, touching her curlers every few seconds. We stood around the kitchen. Want to go to the club for lunch? I asked. Abilene swung through the kitchen door, then in the dining room. I caught a glimpse of silver and Battenberg lace. I can't. I hate to rush you out, but Mama's meeting me at the Jewel Taylor shop. She shot her eyes out the front window again. You know how Mama hates to wait? Her smile grew exponentially. I'm sorry. Don't let me keep you. I patted her shoulder and headed for the door, and then it hit me. How could I be so dumb? It's Wednesday, 12 o'clock. It's Bridge Club. I backed the Cadillac down her drive, sorry that I embarrassed her so. When I turned, I saw her face stretched up to the window watching me leave, and that's when I realized she wasn't embarrassed, that she had made me feel bad. Elizabeth Leifolt was embarrassed to be seen with me. A park on Abilene Street, several houses down from hers, knowing we need to be even more cautious than ever. Even though Hilly would never come to this part of town, she is a threat to us till all now, and I feel like her eyes are everywhere. I know the glee she would feel catching me doing this. I don't underestimate how far she would go to make sure I suffered the rest of my life. It's a crisp December night and a fine rain is just starting to fall. Head down, I hurry along the street. My conversation this afternoon with Mrs. Stein is still racing through my head. I've been trying to prioritize everything left to do, but the hardest part is I have to ask Abilene again about what happened to Constantine. I cannot do a just job on Constantine's story if I don't know what happened to her. It defeats the point of the book to put in only part of the story. It wouldn't be telling the truth. I hurry into Abilene's kitchen and the look on my face must tell her something wrong. What is it? Somebody see you? No, I say, pulling papers from my satchel. I talked to Mrs. Stein this morning. I tell her everything I know about the deadline, about the pile. All right, so... Abilene is counting days in her head, the same way I have been all afternoon. So we got two and a half weeks instead of six weeks. Oh, law, that ain't enough time. We still got to finish writing the Lovinia section, smooth out Faye Bell, and the mini section. Hey, right, Miss Skeeter. We ain't even got a title yet. I put my head in my hands. I feel like I'm slipping underwater. That's not all, I say. She, she wants me to write about Constantine. She asked me what happened to her. Abilene sets her cup of tea down. I can't write it if I don't know what happened, Abilene. So if you can't tell me, I'm wondering, is there someone else who will? Abilene shakes her head. I reckon they is, she says, but I don't want nobody else telling you that story. Then will you? Abilene takes off her black glasses and rubs her eyes. She puts them back on, not expect to see a tired face. She's worked all day. She'll be working even harder now to try and make the deadline. I fidget in my chair waiting for her answer. But she doesn't look tired at all. She's sitting up straight and giving me a de defiant nod. I'll write it down. Give me a few days. I'll tell you everything that happened to Constantine. I work for 15 hours straight on Luvinia's interview. On Thursday night, I go to the league meeting. I'm dying to get out of the house, antsy from nerves, jittery about the deadline. The Christmas tree is starting to smell too rich. The spice orange is sickly decadent. Mother's always cold, and my parents' house feels like I'm soaking in a vat of hot butter. I pause on the league steps, taking a deep breath of clean winter air. It's pathetic, but I'm glad I still to still have the newsletter. 
Once a week, I actually feel like I'm a part of things, and who knows, maybe this time will be different with the holidays starting and all. But the minute I walk in, backs turn. My exclusion is tangible, as if concrete walls have formed around me. Hilly gives me a smirk, whips her head around to speak to someone else. I go deeper in the crowd and see Elizabeth, and she smiles, I wave. I want to talk to her about Mother, tell her I'm getting worried. But before I get too close, Elizabeth turns, heads down, and walks away. I go to my seat. This is new from her, here. Instead of my usual seat up front, I slip up in the back row, angry that Elizabeth wouldn't even say hello. Beside me is Rachel Cole Brandt. Rachel hardly ever comes to meetings, with three kids working on her master's in English from Millsaps College. I wish we were better friends, but I know she's too busy. On my other side is damn Leslie Fuller Bean and her cloud hairspray. She must risk her life every time she lights a cigarette. I wonder if I pushed the top of her head with aerosol spray out of her mouth. Almost every girl in the room has her legs crossed, a lit cigarette in her hand. The smoke gathers and curls around the ceiling. I haven't smoked in two months and the smell makes me feel ill. Hilly steps up to the podium and announces the upcoming gimme drives. Coat drive, can drive, book drive, and a plain old money drive. And then we get to Hilly's favorite part in the meeting, the trouble list. This is where she gets to call out the names of anyone laid on their dues or tardy for meetings or not fulfilling their ph philanthropic duties. I'm always on the trouble list nowadays for something. Hilly's wearing a red wool A-line dress with a cape coat over it, Sherlock Holmes style, even though it's hot as fire in here. Every once in a while she tosses back the front flap like it's in her way, but she looks like she enjoys this gesture too much for it really to be a problem. Her helper, Mary Nell, stands next to her, hand in her notes. Mary Nell has the look of a blonde lap dog, the Pekingese kind with tiny feet and a nose that perks on the end. Now we have something very exciting to discuss. Hilly accepts the note from the lap dog and scans over them. The committee has decided that our newsletter could use a little updating. I sit up straighter. Shouldn't I decide on changes to the newsletter? First of all, we're changing the newsletter from a weekly to a monthly. It's just too much with stamps going up to six cents and all. We're adding a fashion column, highlighting some of the best outfits worn by our members, and a makeup column with all the latest trends. Oh, and the, li the trouble list, of course. They'll be in there, too. She nods her head, making eye contact with a few members. And finally, the most exciting change we've decided to name the new correspondents, the Tatler. After the European magazine, all the ladies over there read. Isn't that the cutest name? Says Mary Lou White, and Haley's so proud of herself. She doesn't even bang the gavel at her for speaking out of turn. Okay, then, it's time to choose an editor for our new modern monthly. Any nominations? Several hands pop up, and I sit very still. Gina Price. Gina Price? What say ye? I say Haley. I nominate Hill Hillbrook. Aren't you the sweetest thing? I'll write any others. Rachel Cole Brandt turns and looks at me like, aren't you believing this? Evidently, she's the only one in the room who doesn't know about me and Hilly. Any seconds to... Hilly looks down at the podium like she can't quite remember who's been nominated. To Hilly Holbrook as editor. I second. I third. Bang, bang goes the gavel and I have lost my post as editor. Leslie Fuller being is staring at me with eyes so wide I can see there isn't anything back there with her brain, where her brain should be. Skeeter, is that your job? Rachel says. It was my job. I mutter and head straight for the doors when the meeting is over. No one speaks to me. No one looks me in the eye. I keep my head high. In the foyer, Hilly and Elizabeth talk. Hilly tucks her dark hair behind her ears, gives me a diplomatic smile. She strides off to chat with someone else, but Elizabeth stays where she is. She touches my arm as I walk out. Hey, Elizabeth, I murmur. Sorry, Skeeter, she whispers, and her eyes hang together. But then she looks away, and I walk down the steps into the dark parking lot. I thought she had something more to say to me, but I guess I was wrong. I don't go straight home after the league meeting. I roll all the Cadillac windows down and let the air, night air blow on my face. It is warm and cold at the same time. I know I need to go home and work on the stories, but I turn onto the wide lanes of State Street and just drive. I've never felt so empty in my life. I can't help but think of all that's piling on top of me. I will never make this deadline. My friends despise me. Stuart is gone. Mother is... I don't know what mother is, but we all know it's more than just stomach ulcers. 
The sun and sandbars close and I go by slow, stare at how dead a neon sign seems when it's turned off. I coast past the tall Lamar Life building through the yellow blinking streetlights. It's only eight o'clock at night, but everyone has gone to bed. Everyone's asleep in this town in every way possible. I wish I could just leave here, I say, and my voice sounds eerie, with no one to hear it. In the dark, I get a glimpse of myself from way above, like in a movie. I become one of those people who prowl around at night in their cars. God, I am the town's Boo Radley, just like in To Kill a Mockingbird. I flick on the radio, desperate for noise to fill my ears. It's my party is playing, and I search for something else. I'm starting to hate the whiny teenage songs about love and nothing. In a moment of aligned wavelengths, I pick up Memphis WKPO, and out comes a man's voice, drunk sounding, singing fast and bluesy. At a dead end street, I ease into the totesum store parking lot and listen to the song. It is better than anything I ever heard. You'll sink like a stone for the times they are a changing. A voice in a can tells me his name is Bob Dylan, but as the next song starts, the signal fades. I lean back in my seat, stare out the dark window of the stores. I feel a rush of inexplicable relief. I feel like I've just heard something from the future. At the phone booth outside the store, I put in a dime and call Mother. I know she'll wait up for me until I get home. Hello? It's Daddy's voice at 8.15 at night. Daddy, why are you up? What's wrong? You need to come home. Come on home now, darling. The street light suddenly feels too bright in my eyes. The night very cold. Is it Mama? Is she sick? Stuart's been sitting on the porch for almost two hours now. He's waiting on you. Stuart? It doesn't make sense, but Mama, but Mama, she's, oh, Mama, fine. In fact, she brightened up a little. Come on home, Skeeter. Tend to Stuart now. The drive home has never felt so long. Ten minutes later, I pull up in the front of the house to see Stuart sitting on the top porch step. Daddy's in a rocking chair, and they both stand when I turn off the car. Hey, Daddy, I say, and I don't look at Stuart. Where's Mama? She's asleep. I just checked on her. Daddy yawns. I haven't seen him up past seven o'clock in ten years when the spring cotton froze. Night, you two. Turn the lights out when you're done. Daddy goes inside and Stuart and I are left alone. The night is so black, so quiet. I can't see stars or moon or even a dog in the yard. What are you doing here? I say in my voice. It sounds small. I came to talk to you. I sit on the front step and I put my head down on my arms. Just say it fast and then go on. I was getting better. I heard the song. I almost felt better ten minutes ago. He moves closer to me, but not so close that we're touching. I wish we were touching. I came to tell you something. I came, I came to say that I saw her. I lift my head up. The first word in my head is selfish. You selfish son of a bitch. Come in here to talk about Patricia. I went out there to San Francisco two weeks ago and I got in my truck and drove for four days and knocked on the door of the apartment house her mom gave me the address to. I cover my face and all I can see is Stuart pushing her hair back like he used to with me. I don't want to know this. I told her I thought that was the ugliest thing you could do to a person. Lie that way. She looked so different, had on this prairie looking dress and a peace sign, her hair was long. She didn't have any lipstick on. She laughed when she saw me. Then she called me a whore. He rubbed his eyes hard with his knuckles. She's the one who took her clothes off for that guy. Said I was a whore to my daddy. A whore to Mississippi. Why are you telling me this? My fists are clenched and I taste metal. I bit down on my tongue. I drove out there because of you. After we broke up, I knew I had to get her out of my head, and I did it, Skeeter. I drove 2,000 miles there and back, and I'm here to tell you it's, it's done. It's dead. It's gone. Well, good, Stuart. I said, good for you. He moves closer and leans down, so I will look at him. And I feel sick, literally nauseated by the smell of bourbon on his breath. Yet I still want to fold myself up and put my entire body in his arms. I'm loving him and hating him at the same time. Go home, I say, hardly believing myself. There's no place left inside me for you. I don't believe that. You're too late, Stuart. Can I come by on Saturday to talk to you some more? I shrug. 
my eyes full of tears. I won't let him throw me away again. It's already happened too many times with him. With my friends, I'd be stupid to let it happen again. I really don't care what you do. I wake up at 5 a.m. and start working on the stories. With only 17 days until our deadline, I work through the day and night with a speed and efficiency I didn't know I possessed. I finish Lavinia's story half the time it took me to write the others, and with an intense burning headache, I turn off the light as the first rays of sun peek through the window. If Adeline will give me Constantine's story by early next week, I just might be able to pull this off. And then I realize I do not have 17 more days. How dumb of me. I have 10 days because I haven't accounted for the time it will take to mail it to New York. I'd cry if only I had the time to do it. A few hours later, I wake up and go back to work. At 5 in the afternoon, I hear Carl pull up and see Stuart climb out of his truck. I tear myself away from the typewriter and go out on the front porch. Hello, I say, standing in the doorway. Hey, Skeeter. He nods at me shyly, I think, compared to his way two nights ago. Afternoon, Mr. Phelan. Hey there, son. Daddy gets up from his rocket chair. I'll let you kids talk out here. Don't get up, Daddy. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm busy today. Stuart, you're welcome to sit out here with Daddy as long as you like. I go back in the house, past Mother at the kitchen table, drinking warm milk. Was that Stuart I saw out there? I go in the dining room. I stand back from the windows where I know Stuart can't see me, and I watch until he drives away, and then I just keep watching. That night, as usual, I go to Abilene's, and I tell her about the deadline of only ten days, and she looks like she might cry. Then I hand her Lavinia's chapter to read, the one I've written at lightning speed. Minnie's at the kitchen table with us, drinking a Coke, looking out the window. I hadn't known she'd be here tonight. Wish she'd leave us to work. Abilene puts it down, nods. I think this chapter's right good. Read just as well as the slow wrote ones. I sigh, leaning back in my chair, thinking of what else needs to be done. We need to decide on the title, I say, and I rub my temples. I've been working on a few. I think we should call it Colored Domestics and the Southern Families for Which They Work. Say what? Minnie says, looking at me for the first time. That's the best way to describe it, don't you think, I say? If you got a corn cob up your butt. This isn't fiction, Minnie. It's sociology. It has to sound exact. But that don't mean it have to sound boring, Minnie says. Abilene, I sigh, hoping we can resolve this tonight. What do you think? Abilene shrugs, and I can see already she's putting on her peacemaking smile. It seems she has to smooth things over every time Minnie and I are in the same room. That's a good title. Of course, you're going to get tired of typing all that on top of every page, she says. I told her this is how it has to be done. Well, it could shorten a little, I say, and I pull out my pencil. Abilene scratches her nose and says, What do you think about just calling it help? Help? Minnie repeats like she never heard of the word. Help, I say. Abilene shrugs, looks down shyly like she's a little embarrassed. I ain't trying to take over your idea. I just, I like to keep things simple, you know. I guess help. Sounds all right to me, Minnie says and crosses her arms. I like help, I say, because I really do. And I add, I think we'll still have to put that description underneath so the category is clear, but I think that's a good title. Good is right, Minnie says, because if things get printed, Lord knows we're going to need some. On Sunday afternoon, with eight days left, I come downstairs dizzy and blinking from staring at Pika type all day. I was almost glad when I heard Stewart's call pull up the drive. I, dr I rub my eyes. Maybe I'll sit with him a while, clear my head, then go back and work through the night. Stuart climbs out of his mud-splattered truck. He's still in his Sunday tie, and I try to ignore how handsome he looks. I stretch my arms. It's ridiculously warm out considering Christmas is in two and a half weeks. Mother's sitting on the porch in a rocking chair swathed in blankets. Hello, Mrs. Fallon. How are you feeling today? Stuart asks. Mother gives him a regal nod. Fair. Thank you for asking. I'm surprised by the coolness in her voice. She turns back to her newsletter, and I can't help but smile. Mother knows he's been stopping, but she hasn't mentioned it but once. I have to wonder when it will come. Hey, he says to me quietly as we sit on the bottom porch step. Silently, we watch our old cat Sherman sneak round a tree, his tail swaying, going after some creature we can't see. Stuart puts his hand on my shoulder. I can't stay today. I'm heading to Dallas right now for an oil meeting. I'll be gone three days, he says. I just came by to tell you. 
All right. I shrug like it makes no difference. All right, then, he says, and he gets back in his truck. When he disappeared, Mother clears her throat. I don't turn around and look at her in the rocking chair. I don't want her to see the disappointment in my face that he's gone. Go ahead, Mother. I finally mutter, say what you want to say. Don't you let him cheapen you. I look back at her. I her suspiciously, even though she is so frail under the wool blanket. Sorry is the fool who ever underestimates my mother. If Stuart doesn't know how intelligent and kind I raised you to be, he can march straight on back to State Street. She narrows her eyes out in the Winterland. Frankly, I don't care much for Stuart. He doesn't know how lucky he was to have you. I let Mother's words sit like a tiny sweet candy on my tongue. Forcing myself up from the step I head for the front door. There's so much work to be done, not nearly enough time. Thank you, Mother. I kiss her softly on the cheek and go inside. I'm exhausted and irritable. For 48 hours, I've done nothing but type. I'm stupid with facts about other people's lives. My eyes sting from the smell of typing ink. My fingers are stripped with paper cuts. Who knew paper and ink could be so vicious? With just six days left, I go over to Abilene's. She's taken a weekend, weekday off from work, despite Elizabeth's annoyance. I can tell she knows what we need to discuss before I even say it. She leaves me in the kitchen, comes back with a letter in her hand. For I give this to you, I think I ought to tell you something so you can really understand. I nod, I'm tense in my chair. I want to tear the envelope open and get this over with. Abilene straightens her notebook that's sitting on the kitchen table, and I watch as she aligns her yellow pencils. Remember I told you Constantine had a daughter? Well, Lula Bell was her name. La, she come out pale as snow, grew hair the color of hay, not curly like yours, straight it was. She was that white, I ask. I've wondered this ever since Abilene told me about Constantine's child. Way back in Elizabeth's kitchen. I think about how surprised Constantine must have been to hold a white baby and know it was hers. She nods. When Lula Bell was four years old, Constantine, Abilene shifts in her chair, she'd take her to an orphanage up in Chicago. An orphanage? You mean she gave her baby away? As much as Constantine loved me, I can only imagine how much she must have loved her own child. Abilene looked me straight in the eye and I see something there I rarely see frustration, antipathy. A lot of colored women's got to give their children up, Miss Skeeter. Send their kids off because they have to tend to a white family. I looked down, wondering if Constantine couldn't take care of her child because she had to take care of us. But most of them sent, uh, most sent them off to family. An orphanage is different altogether. Why didn't she send the baby to her sisters or another relative? Her sister, she just couldn't handle it. Being Negro with white skin in Mississippi, it's like you don't belong to nobody. But it wasn't just hard on the girl, it was hard on Constantine. She, folks would look at her. White folks would stop her, ask her all suspicious what she'd do in toting around a white child. Policemen would stop her on State Street, told her she need to get her uniform on. Even colored folks, they treat her different. Distrustful, like she'd done something wrong. It was hard for her to find somebody to watch Lula Bell while she was at work. Constantine got to where she didn't want to bring Lula out much. Was she already working for my mother then? She'd been with your mama a few years. That's where she met the father, Connor. He worked on your farm, lived back there in Hot Stack. Abilene shakes her head. We was all surprised Constantine would go off and get herself in a family way. Some folks at church wasn't so kind about it, especially when the baby come out white, even though the father was black as me. I'm sure Mother wasn't too pleased either. Mother, I'm sure, knew all about it. She always kept tabs on all the colored help with their, in their situations where they live, if they're married, how many children they have. It's more of a control thing than a real interest. She wants to know who's walking around on her property. Was it a colored orphanage or a white one? Because I'm thinking, I'm hoping, maybe Constantine just wanted a better life for her child. Maybe she thought she'd be adopted by a white family and not feel so different. Colored. White ones wouldn't take her. I heard. I guess they knew. Maybe they seen that kind of thing before. 
When Constantine went to the train station with Lula Bell to take her up there, I heard white folks was staring on that platform, wanting to know why a little girl, white girl was going in the color car. And when Constantine left her at the place up in Chicago, four is pretty old to be get, get given up, and Lula Bell was screaming. That's what Constantine told somebody at our church. Said Lula was screaming and thrashing, trying to get her mom to come back to her. But Constantine, even with that sound in her ears, she left her there. As I listen, it starts to hit me what Abilene is telling me. If I hadn't had the mother I have, I might not have thought it. She gave her up because she was ashamed? Because her daughter was what? Abilene opens her mouth to disagree, but then she closes it and looks down. A few years later, Constantine wrote the orphanage and told him she'd made a mistake. She wanted her girl back, but Lula had already been adopted. She was gone. Constantine always said giving her child away was the worst mistake she'd ever made in her life. Abilene leans back in her chair, and she said if she ever got a little bell back, she'd never let her go. I sit quietly, my heart aching for Constantine, and I'm starting to dread what this has to do with my mother. About two years ago, Constantine get a letter from Lula Bell. I reckon she was 25 by then, and it said her adoptive parents gave her the address. They start writing to each other. Lula Bell sh says she wants to come down and stay with her a while. Constantine, la, she was so nervous she couldn't walk straight. Too nervous to eat, wouldn't even take no water. Kept throwing it up. I had her on my prayer list. Two years ago, I was up at school then. Why didn't Constantine tell me in her letters what was going on? She took all her savings and bought new clothes for Lula Bell, hair things. Had the church be sew her new quilt for the bed Lula looked going to sleep in. She told us at prayer meeting, Why if she hate me? She going to ask me why I give her away if I tell her the truth. She'll hate me for what I've done. Abilene looks up from her cup of tea and smiles a little. She tells us, I can't wait for Skeeter to meet her when she get back home from school. I forgot about that. I didn't know who Skeeter was back then. I remember my last letter from Constantine that she had a surprise for me. I realized now she'd wanted to introduce me to, their to her daughter. I swallowed back tears coming up in my throat. What happened when Lula Bell came down to see her? Abilene slides the envelope across the table. I reckon you ought to read that part at home. At home, I go upstairs without even stopping to sit down. I open Abilene's letter it's on the notebook paper covering the front and back, written in cursive pencil. Afterward, I stare at the eight pages I've already written about walking to hot stack with Constantine, the puzzles we worked on together, her pressing her thumb in my hand. I take a deep breath and I put my hands on the typewriter keys and I can't waste any more time. I have to finish her story. I write about what Abilene told me that Constantine had a daughter and had to give her up so she could work for my family, the Millers, I call us. I don't put in that Constantine's daughter. Uh, um, I'm so sorry. The Millers, I call us, after Henry, my favorite band author. I don't put in that Constantine's daughter was high yellow. I just don't want to. Sh I just want to show that Constantine's love for me began with missing her own child. Perhaps that's what made it so unique, so deep. It didn't matter that I was white. While she was wanting her own daughter back, I was longing for mother not to be disappointed in me. For two days, I read all the way through my childhood, my college years, where we sent letters to each other every week. But then I stop and listen to mother coughing downstairs, and I hear daddy's footsteps going to her. I light a cigarette and stub it out, thinking, don't start up again. The toilet water rushes through the house, filled with a little more of my mother's body. I light another cigarette and smoke it down to my fingers. I can't write a what, about what's in Abilene's letter. That afternoon, I call Abilene at home. I can't put it in the book, I tell her. About Mother and Constantine, I'll end it when, I'll end it when I go to college. I just miss Skeeter. I know I should. I know I should be sacrificing as much as you and many and all of you. But I can't do that to my mother. No one expects you to, Miss Skeeter. Truth is, I wouldn't think real high if you did. That next evening, I go to the kitchen for some tea. Eugenia, are you downstairs? I tread back to Mother's room. Dad is not in her bed yet, and I hear the television out in the relaxing room. I'm here, Mama. 
She's in her bed at six in the evening with a white bowl by her side. Have you been crying? You know how that ages your skin, dear. I sit in the straight cane chair beside her bed and I think about how I should begin. Part of me understands why Mother acted the way she did because really, wouldn't anybody be angry about what Lula Bell did? But I need to hear my mother's side of the story. If there's anything redeeming about my mother that Abilene left out of the letter, I want to know. I want to talk about Constantine, I say. Oh, Eugenia, Mother chides and pats my hand. That was almost two years ago. Mama, I say, and I make myself look into her eyes. Even though she is terribly thin and her collarbone is long and narrow beneath her skin, her eyes are still as sharp as ever. What happened? What happened with her daughter? Mother's jaw tightens and I can't tell. She, I can tell she's surprised that I know about her. I wait for her to refuse to talk about it as before. And she takes a deep breath, moves the white bowl a little closer to her, says, Constantine sent her up to Chicago to live. She couldn't take care of her. I nod and wait. They're different that way, you know. Those people have children don't think about the consequences until it's too late. They. Those people. Reminds me of Hilly. Mother sees it on my face, too. Now you look. I was good to Constantine. Oh, she talked back plenty of times. I'll put up with it. But Skeeter, she didn't give me a choice at the time. I know, Mother. I know what happened. Who told you? Who else knows about this? And I see the paranoia rising in Mother's eyes. It is her greatest fear coming true. And I feel sorry for her. I will never tell you who told me. All I can say is it was no one important to you. I can't believe you would do that, Mother. How dare you judge me after what she did? Do you really know what happened? Were you there? I see the old anger. An obstinate woman who survived years of bleeding ulcers. That girl! She shakes her knobby finger at me. She showed up here. I had the entire door chapter at my, at my house. You were at, up at school. The doorbell was ringing nonstop, and Constantine was in the kitchen making all that coffee ever over since the old percolator burned the first two pots right up. Mother waves away the remembered reek of scorched coffee. They were all in the living room having cake. Nine to five people in the house, and she's drinking coffee. She's talking to Sarah Vaughn's sister and walk around the house like a guest sticking cake in her mouth. And then she's filling out the form to become a member. Again, I nod. Maybe I didn't know those details, but they, they don't change what happened. She looked white as anybody, and she knew it, too. She knew exactly what I was doing, and I say, How do you do? And she laughs and says, Fine. So I say, And what's your name? And she says, You mean you don't know? I'm Lula Bell Bates. I'm grown now, and I'm moving back with my mama. Got here yesterday morning. Then she goes over to help herself to another piece of cake. Bates, I say, because this is another detail I didn't know, albeit insig insignificant. She changed her last name back to Constantine's. Thank God nobody heard her. But then she starts talking to Phoebe Miller, the president of the Southern States of Dar. And I pull her into the kitchen. I say, Lula Bell, you can't stay here. You need to go on. And oh, she look at me haughty. She said, what, you don't allow colored Negroes in your living room if you're not clean, if we're not cleaning up? That's when Constantine walks in the kitchen. She looks as shocked as I am. And I say, Lula Bell, you get out of this house before I call Mr. Phelan. But she won't budge. Says, when I thought she was white, I treated her fine and dandy. Says, up in Chicago, she part of some under, under the gr ground group. So I tell Constantine, I say, you get your daughter out of my house right now. Mother's eyes seem more deep set than ever, and her nostrils are flaring. So, Constantine, she tell Lula Bell, go on back to their house. And Lula Bell says, fine. I was leaving anyway. Heads for the dining room, and of course I stop her. Oh, no, I say. You go out that back door, not the front door with the white guests. I was not about to have the dar find out about this. And I told that bit broady, body girl whose own mama we gave $10 extra to every Christmas. She was not to step foot on this farm again. And do you know what she did? Yep, I, I think, but I keep my face blank. I'm still searching for this redemption. Spit in my face. A negro in my home trying to act white. I shudder. Who would have ever had the nerve to spit at my mother? I told Constantine that girl better not show her face again. Not to Hotstack, not to the state of Mississippi. 
nor would I tolerate her keeping terms with Lula Bell, not as long as your daddy was paying Constantine's rent on that house back there. But it was Lula Bell acting that way, not Constantine. What if she stayed? I couldn't have that girl going around Jackson acting white when she was colored, telling everybody she got into a dar party at Longleaf. I just thank God nobody ever found out about it. She tried to embarrass me in my own home, Eugenia, five minutes before she had Phoebe Miller filling out her form for her to join. She hadn't seen her daughter in 20 years. You can't tell a person they can't see their child. But Mother is caught up in her own story. And Constantine? She thought she could get me to change my mind. Miss Phelan, please just let her stay at, my, at the house. She won't come on this side again. I hadn't seen her in so long. And that Lula Bell with her hand up on her hip saying, Yeah, my daddy died. My mom was too sick to take care of me when I was a baby. She had to give me away. You can't keep us apart. Mother lowers her voice and she seems matter of fact now. I looked at Constantine. I felt so much shame for her. To get pregnant in the first place and then to lie. I feel sick and hot. I am ready for this to be over. Mother narrows her eyes. It's time you learn, Eugenia, how things really are. You idolize Constantine too much. You always have. She points her finger at me. They are not like regular people. I can't look at her. I close my eyes. And then what happened, Mother? I asked Constantine just as plain as day. Is that what you told her? Is that how you cover your mistakes? This is the part I was hoping wasn't true. This is what I'd hoped Abilene had been wrong about. I told Lula Bell the truth. I told her, your daddy didn't die. He left the day after you were born and your mama hadn't been sick a day in her life. She gave you up because you were too high yellow. She didn't want you. Why couldn't you let her believe what Constantine told her? Constantine was so scared she wouldn't like her and that's why you, she told her those things. Because Lula Bell needed to know the truth. She needed to go back to Chicago where she belonged. I let my head sink into my hands. This is no redeeming piece of the story. I know why Abilene hadn't wanted to tell me. A child should never know this about her own mother. I never thought Constantine would go to Illinois with her. Eugenia, honestly, I was, I was sorry to see her go. You weren't, I say. I think about Constantine after living 50 years in this country, sitting in a tiny apartment in Chicago, how lonely she must have felt. How bad her knees must have felt in that cold. I was. And even though I told her not to write to you, she probably would have if there had been more time. More time? Constantine died, Skeeter. I sent her a check for her birthday to the address I found for her daughter, but Lula Bell sent it back with a copy of the obituary. Constantine? I cry. I wish I'd known. Why didn't you tell me, Mama? Mother sniffs, keeping her eyes straight ahead. She quickly wipes her eyes. Because I knew you'd blame me when it... It wasn't my fault. When did she die? How long was she living in Chicago? Mother pulls the basin closer and hugs it to her side. Three weeks. Abilene opens her back door and lets me in. Minnie's sitting at the table, stirring her coffee, and when she sees me, she tugs the sleeve of her own dress down. But I see the edge of a white bandage on her arm. She grumbles a hello and goes back to her cup. I put the manuscript down on the table with a thump. If I mail it in the morning, that still leaves six days for it to get there. We might just make it. I smile through my exhaustion. Ah, oh, that is something. Look at all them pages. Havilene grins and sits on her stool. 266 of them. Now we just wait and see, I say, and we all three stare at the stack. Finally, Minnie says, and I can see the hint of something. Not exactly a smile, but more like satisfaction. The room grows quiet, and it's dark outside the window. The post office is already closed, so I brought it over to show Abilene and Minnie one last time before I mail it. Usually, I only bring over sections at a time. What if they find out, Abilene says quietly. Minnie looks up from her coffee. What if folks find out Niceville is Jackson, or figure out who's who? They ain't gonna know, Minnie says. Jackson ain't no special place. There's 10,000 towns just like it. We haven't talked about this in a while, and besides, Winnie's com comments about tongues, we haven't really dis 
discuss the actual consequences besides the maids losing their jobs. For the past eight months, all we thought about is just getting it written. Minnie, you got your kids to think about, Abilene says, and Leroy, if he finds out. The sureness in Minnie's eyes changes to something darting, paranoid. Leroy going to be mad, sure enough. She tugs at her sleeve again, mad then sad if the white people catch a hold of me. You think maybe we ought to find a place we could go in case it get bad, Abilene asks. They both think about this and then shake their heads. I don't know where we'd go, Minnie says. You might think about that, Miss Skeeter, somewhere for yourself. I can't leave mother, I say I've been standing and I sink down into a chair. Abilene, do you think they'd hurt us? I mean, like what's in the papers? Abilene cocks her head at me, confused. She wrinkles her forehead like we've had a misunderstanding. They'd beat us. They'd come out here with baseball bats. Maybe they won't kill us, but but who exactly would do this? The white women we've been writing, up, writing about? They wouldn't have they wouldn't hurt us, would they? I ask. Don't you know white men's like nothing better than protecting the white women so they're their town. My skin prickles. I'm not so afraid for myself, but for what I've done to Abilene and to Minnie, to Lavinia and Faye Bell, and eight other women. The book is sitting there on the table, and I want to put it in my satchel and hide it. Instead, I look to Minnie, because for some reason I think she's the only one who really understands what could happen. She doesn't look back at me, though. She is lost in thought, and she's running her thumbnail back and forth across her lid. Minnie, what do you think, I ask. Minnie keeps her eyes on the window and nods at her own thoughts. I think what we need is some insurance. Ain't no such thing, Abilene says. Not for us. What if we put the terrible awful in the book, Minnie asks. We can't, Minnie, Abilene says. It'd give us away. But if we put it in there, then Miss Hilly can't let anybody find out about the book. Is that the book is about Jackson? She don't want anybody to know that stories about her. And if they start getting close to figuring it out, she gonna steer them the other way. Ah, oh, Minnie, that is too risky. Nobody can predict what that woman's gonna do. Nobody know that story but Miss Hill and her own mama. Minnie says, and Miss Celia, but she ain't got no friends to tell anyway. What happened, I ask. Is it really that terrible? Appleine looks at me, and my eyebrows go up. Who's she going to admit it to? Minnie asks Abilene. She ain't going to want you and Miss Leafle to get identified either. Abilene, because then people going to be just one step away. I'm telling you, Miss Healy's the best protection we got. Abilene shakes her head and then nods, then shakes it again. We watch her and wait. If we put the terrible awful in the book and people do find out that that was you and Miss Healy, then you in so much trouble. Abilene shudders. There ain't even a name for it. That's a risk I'm just going to have to take. I already made up my mind. Either put it in or put my part out altogether. Abilene and Minnie's eyes hang on each other. We can't pull out Minnie's section. It's the last chapter of the book. It's about getting fired 19 times in the same small town about what it's like trying to keep the anger inside but never succeeding. It starts with her mother's rules of how to work for white women, all the way up to leaving Mrs. Walters. I want to speak up, but I keep my mouth shut. Finally, Abilene sighs. All right, Abilene says, shaking her head. I reckon you better tell her then. Minnie narrows her eyes at me, and I pull out a pencil and pad. I'm only telling you for the book, you understand? Ain't nobody sharing no, benef no heartfelt secrets here. I'll make us some more coffee, Abilene says. On the drive back to Longleaf, I shudder, thinking about Minnie's pie story. I don't know if we'd be safer leaving it out or putting it in, not to mention, if I can't get it written in time to make the mail tomorrow, it will put us yet another day later, shortening our chances to make the deadline. I can picture the red fury on Haley's face, the hate she still feels for Minnie. I know my old friend well. If we're found out, Haley will be our fiercest enemy. Even if we're not found out, printing the pie story will put Hilly in a rage like we've never seen. But Minnie's right. It's our best insurance. I'll look over my shoulder every quarter mile. I keep exactly to the speed limit and stay on the back roads. They will beat us. Rings in my ears. I ride all night, grimacing over the details of Minnie's story and all the next day. And at four in the afternoon, I jam the manuscript in a cardboard letter box. 
I quickly wrap the box in brown paper wrapping. Usually it takes seven or eight days, but it will somehow have to get to New York City in six days to make the deadline. I speed to the post office known it closes at 4.30 despite my fear of the police and rush inside to the window. I haven't gone to sleep since the night before last. My hair is literally sticking straight up in the air. The postman's eyes widen. Windy outside? Please, can you get this out today? It's going to New York. He looks at the address. At the address. Out of town truck's gone, ma'am. Have to wait till morning. He stamps the postage and I head back home. Soon as I walk in, I go straight to the pantry and call Elaine Stein's office. Her secretary puts me through and I tell her in a hoarse, tired voice, I mailed the manuscript today. The last editor's meeting is in six days, Eugenia. Not only will I have to get here in time, I'll have to have time to read it and I'd say it's highly unlikely. There's nothing left to say, so I just murmur, I know. Thank you for the chance, and I add, Merry Christmas, Mrs. Stein. We call it Hanukkah, but thank you, Miss Fidlon. After I hang up the phone, I go and stand on the porch and stare at the cold land. I'm so dog-tired, I hadn't even noticed Dr. Neal's cars here. He must have arrived while I was at the post office. I lean against the rail and wait for him to come out of Mother's room, down the hall, through the open front door, so I can, I can see that her bedroom door is closed. A little while later, Dr. Neal gently closes her door behind him and walks out to the porch, and he stands beside me. I gave her something to help with the pain, he says. The pain? Was Mama vomiting this morning? Old Dr. Neal stares at me through his cloudy blue eyes and looks at me long and hard as if trying to decide something about me. Your mother has cancer, Eugenia, in the lining of the stomach. I reach for the side of the house. I'm shocked, and yet, didn't I know this? She didn't want to tell you, he shakes his head, but since she refuses to stay in the hospital, you need to know. These next few months are going to be pretty hard, he raises his eyebrows at me, on her and you too. Few months? It, is that all? I cover my mouth with my hand, hear myself groan. Maybe longer, maybe sooner, honey. He shakes his head. Knowing your mother, though, he glances into the house. She's going to fight like the devil. I can't. I stand there in a daze, unable to speak. Call me any time, Eugenia, at the office or at home. I walk into the house, back to Mother's room. Daddy's on the settee by the bed, staring at nothing. Mother's sitting straight up, and she rolls her eyes when she sees me. Well, I guess he told you, she says. Tears drip off my chin, and I hold her hands. How long have you known? About two months. Oh, Mama. Now stop that, Eugenia. It can't be helped. But what can I... I can't just sit here and watch you. I can't even say the word. All the words are still too awful. You most certainly will not just sit here. Carlton is going to be a lawyer, and you? She shakes her finger at me. Don't you... Don't think you can just let yourself go after I'm gone. I'm calling Fanny Mays. The minute I can walk to the kitchen and make your hair appointment through 1975... I sink down on the settee and cry. Daddy puts his arms around me and I lean against him. The Christmas tree Jameso put up a week ago dries and drops needles every time someone walks into the relaxing room. It's still six days until Christmas, but no one's bothered to water it. The few presents Mother brought and wrapped back in July sit under the tree. One for Daddy, that's obviously a church tie, some small square for Carlton, and a heavy box for me that I suspect is a new Bible. Now that everyone knows about Mother's cancer, it's as if she's let go of the few threads that kept her upright. The marionette strings are cut, and even her head looks wobbly on its post. The most she can do is get up, go to the bathroom, or sit on the porch a few minutes every day. In the afternoon, I take Mother her mail, good housekeeping magazines, church net letters, dar updates. How are you? I push her hair back from her head and she closes her eyes like she relishes the feel. She is the child now and I am the mother. I'm all right. Pascagoula comes in. She sets a tray broth on the table. Mother barely shakes her head when she leaves, staring off at the empty doorway. Oh no, she says, grimacing. I can't eat. You have to eat, Mama. Well, we'll do it later. It's just not the same with Pascagoula here, is it? She says. No, I say it's not. 
This is the first time she mentioned Constantine since our terrible discussion. They say it's like true love, good help. You only get one in a lifetime. I nod, thinking how I ought to go write that down. Include it in the book, but of course it's too late. It's already been mailed. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing any of us can do now, except to wait for what's coming. Christmas Eve is depressing and rainy and warm. Every half hour, Daddy comes out of his mother's room and looks out the front, out of mother's room and looks out the front window and asks, is he here? Even if no one's listening, my brother Carlton is driving home tonight from LSU Law School and we'll both be relieved to see him. All mother has been wanting all day mother's been vomiting and dry heaving and she can barely keep her eyes open but she cannot sleep charlotte you need to be in the hospital dr neal said that afternoon i don't know how many times he's said that in the past week at least he'd let me get the nurse out here to stay with you charles neal mother said not even raising her head from the mattress i'm not spending my final days in a hospital nor will i turn my house into one Dr. Neal just sighed, gave Daddy more medicine, a new kind, and explained to him how to give it to her. But will it help her? I heard Daddy whisper out in the hall. Can it make her better? Dr. Neal put his hand on Daddy's shoulder. No, Carlton. At six o'clock that night, Carlton finally pulls up, comes in the house. Hey there, Skeeter, he hugs me to him. He's rumpled from the car drive, handsome in his college cable knit sweater. The fresh air smells good on him. It's nice to have someone else here. Jesus, why is it so hot in this house? She's cold, I say, quietly all the time. I go with him to the back. Mother sits up when she sees him, holds her thin arms out. Oh, Carlton, you're home, she says. Carlton stops still, and then he bends down and hugs her very gently. He glances back at me, and I could see the shock on his face. I turn away and cover my mouth so I won't cry, because I won't be able to quit. Carlton look, Carlton's look tells me more than I want to know. When Stuart drops by on Christmas Day, I don't stop him when he tries to kiss me, but I tell him, I'm only letting you kiss me because Mother is dying. I gotta blow my nose, friends. Hang on. Oh, I'm glad I got my trusty box of Kleenex here because, oh, goodness. All right, let's continue. Eugenia, I hear Mother calling it. It's New Year's Eve, and I'm in the kitchen getting some tea. Christmas has passed, and James O took the tree out this morning. Needles still litter the house, but I've managed to put away the decorations and store them back in the closet. It was tiring and frustrating trying to wrap each ornament the way Mother likes it to get them ready for next year. I don't let myself question the futility of it. I've heard nothing from Mrs. Stein and don't even know if the package made it on, on time. Last night I broke down and called Abilene and tell her I've heard nothing, just for the relief of talking about it to someone. I keep thinking of things to put in it, Abilene says. I have to remind myself we already done sent it off. Me too, I say. I'll call you as soon as I hear something. I go in the back. Mother's propped up on her pillows. The gravity of sitting upright, we've learned, helps keep the vomit down. The white enamel bowl is beside her. Hey, Mama, I say, what can I get you? Eugenia, you cannot wear those those slacks to the Holbrook New Year's party. When Mother blinks, she keeps her eyes closed a second too long. She's exhausted, a skeleton in a white dressing gown with absurdly fancy ribbons and starch lace. Her neck swims in the neckline like an 80-pound swan's. She cannot eat unless it's through a straw. She lost her power of smell completely, yet she can sense from an entirely different room if my wardrobe is disappointing. They canceled the party, Mama. Perhaps she is remembering Hilly's party last year. From what Stuart told me, all the parties were canceled because of the president's death. Not that I'd be invited anyway. Tonight, Stuart's coming over to watch Dick Clark on the television. Mother places her tiny, angular hand on mine, so frail the joints show through the skin. I was mother's dress size when I was 11. She looks at me evenly. I think you need to go on and put those slacks on the list now. But they're comfortable and they're warm and she shakes her head and shuts her eyes. I'm sorry, Skeeter. There is no arguing anymore. All right, I sigh. Mother pulls the pad of paper from under the covers tucked in the invisible pocket she's had sewn in every garment. 
where she keeps anti-vomiting pills, tissues, tiny dictatorial lists. Even though she's weak, I'm surprised by the steadiness of her hand as she writes on the do not wear list. Gray, shapeless, manly, mannishly tailor pants. She smiles, satisfied. It sounds macabre, but when Mother realized that after she's dead, she won't be able to tell me what not to wear anymore, she came up with this ingenious post-mortem system. She's assuming I'll never go buy new, unsatisfactory clothes on my own. She's probably right. Still no vomiting yet, I asked, because it's four o'clock and Mother's had two bowls of broth and hasn't been sick once today. Usually she's thrown up at least three times by now. Not even once, she says, but then she closes her eyes, and within seconds... She's asleep. On New Year's Day, I come downstairs to, s to start on the black eyed piece for good luck. Past Gagula set them out to soak last night, instructed me on how to put them in a pot, turn on the flame, put the ham hock in with them. It's pretty much a two step process, yet everyone seems nervous about me turning on the stove. I remember the Constantine always used to come by on January 1st and fix our good luck peas for us, even though it was her day off. She'd make a whole pot, but then deliver one single pea on a plate to everyone in the family and watch us to make sure we ate it. She would be superstitious like that. Then she'd wash the dishes and go back home, but Pascagoula doesn't offer to come in on her holiday, and assuming she's with her own family, I don't ask her to. We're all sad that Carlton had to leave this morning. It's been nice having my brother around to talk to. His last words to me before he hugged me and headed back to school were, Don't burn the house down. Then he added, I'll call tomorrow to see how she is. After I turn off the flame, I walk out at the on the porch, and Dad is leaning on the rail, rolling cotton seeds around in his fingers. He's staring at the empty fields that won't be planted for another month. Daddy, you coming in for lunch? I ask. The peas are ready. He turns, and his smile's thin, starved for reason. This medicine they got her on? He studies his seeds. I think it's working. She keeps saying she feels better. I shake my head in disbelief. He can't really believe this. She's gone two days and only gotten sick once. Oh, Daddy, no. It's just... Daddy, she still has it. But there's an empty look in Daddy's eyes, and I wonder if he even heard me. I know you've got better places to be, Skeeter. There are tears in his eyes now. But not a day passes that I don't think God you're here with her. I nod and feel guilty that he thinks it's a choice I actually made. I hug him and tell him I'm glad I'm here too, Daddy. When the club reopens the first week of January, I put my skirt on, I grab my rack, and I walk through the snack bar, ignoring Patsy Joyner, my old tennis partner who dumped me, and three other girls all smoking all the black at the black iron tables. They lean down and whisper to each other when I pass. I'll be skipping the league meeting tonight and forever, for that matter. I gave in and sent a letter three days ago with my resignation. I slammed the tennis ball into the backboard, trying my best not to think about anything. Lately, I found myself praying when I've never been a very religious person. I find myself whispering long, never-ending sentences to God, begging for my mother to feel some relief, pleading for good news about the book, sometimes even ask for, asking for some hint of what to do about Stuart. Often, I catch myself praying when I don't even know I was doing it. When I get home from the club, Dr. Neal pulls up behind me in his car, and I take him back to Mother's room where Daddy's waiting, and they close the door behind him. I stand there fidgeting in the hall like a kid, and I can see why Daddy's hanging on to his threat hope. Mother's gone four days now without vomit in the group green bile. She's eaten her oatmeal every day, even asked for more. When Dr. Neal comes out, Daddy stays in the chair by the bed, and I follow Dr. Neal out to the porch. She told you, I ask, about how she's feeling better? He nods, but then shakes his head. There's no point in bringing her in for an x-ray. It would just be too hard on her. But is she, could she be improving? I've seen this before, Eugenia. Sometimes people get a burst of strength. It's a gift from God, I guess, so they can go on and finish their business. But that's all it is, honey. Don't expect anything more. But did you see her color? She looks so much better, and she's keeping the food... He shakes his head. Just try and keep her comfortable. On the first Friday of 1964, I can't wait any longer. I stretch the phone into the pantry. Mother is asleep after having eaten a second bowl of oatmeal. 
Her door is open so I can hear her in case she calls. Elaine Stein's office. Hello, is Eugenia Fillon calling long distance? Is she available? I'm sorry, Miss Fillon, but Mrs. Stein isn't taking any calls re regarding her manuscript selection. Oh, but can you at least tell me if she received it? I mailed it just before the deadline. And one moment, please. The phone goes silent, and a minute or so later she comes back. I can confirm that sh we did receive your package at some point during the holidays. Someone from our office will notify you after Mrs. Stein has made her decision. Thank you for calling. And I hear the line on the other end click. A few nights later, after a riveting afternoon answering Miss Myrna letters, Stuart and I sit in the relaxing room, and I'm glad to see him and to eradicate for a while the deadly silence of the house. We sit quietly watching television. A Terryton ad comes on, the one where the girl smoking the cigarettes has black eye. Us Terryton smokers would rather fight than switch. Stuart and I have been seeing each other once a week now. We went to a movie after Christmas and once to dinner in town. But he usually comes out to the house because I don't want to leave Mother. He is hesitant around me, kind of respectfully shy. There's a patience in his eyes that replaces my own panic that I felt with him before. We don't talk about anything serious. He tells me stories about the summer. During golf, he spent working on the oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. The showers were salt water. The ocean was crystal clear blue to the bottom. The other men were doing this brutal work to feed their families while Stuart, a rich kid with rich parents, had college to go back to. It was the first time he said he'd really had to work hard. I'm glad I drilled on the rig back then. I couldn't go off and do it now, he said, like it was ages ago and not five years back. He seems older than I remember. What couldn't you do? Why couldn't you do it now, I asked, because I'm looking for a future for myself. I like to hear about the possibilities of others. He furrowed his brow at me because I couldn't leave you. I tuck this away, afraid to admit how good it was to hear it. The commercial is over. We watch the news report. There's a skirmish in Vietnam. The reporter seems to think it'll be solved without much fuss. Listen, Stuart says after a while of silence between us. I didn't want to bring this up before, but I know what people are saying in town about you, and I don't care. I just want you to know that. My first thought is the book. He's hurt something. My entire body goes tense. What did you hear? You know about that trick you played on Haley. I relax some, but not completely. I never talked to anyone about this except Haley herself, and I wonder if Haley ever called him like she threatened. And I can see how people will think, would take it, think you're some kind of crazy liberal involved in all that mess. I study my hands, still wary of what he might have heard, and a little irritated, too. How do you know, I ask, what I'm involved in, because I know you, Skeeter, he says softly. You're too smart to get mixed up in anything like that, and I told them, too. I nod, try to smile, despite what he thinks he knows about me. I can't help but appreciate that someone out there cares enough to stand up for me. We don't have to talk about all this again, he says. I just wanted you to know, that's all. On Saturday evening, I say goodnight to Mother. I have a long coat on so she can't see my outfit, and I keep the lights off so she can't call men on my hair. Very little has changed with her health. She doesn't seem to be getting any worse. She, the vomiting is still at bay, but her skin is grayish white. Her hair started to fall out. I hold her hands and brush her cheek. Daddy, you'll call the restaurant if you need me. I will, Skeeter. Go have some fun. I get in Stewart's car and he takes me to the Robert E. Lee for dinner. The room is gaudy with gowns, red roses, silver service clinking. There is excitement in the air. The feeling that things are almost back to normal since President Kennedy died. 1964 is a fresh new year. The glances our way are abundant. You look different, Stuart says. I can tell he's been holding in this comment all night, and he seems more confused than impressed. That dress, it, it's so short. I nod and push my hair back the way he used to. This morning, I told Mother I was going shopping. She looks so tired, though I quickly changed my mind. Maybe I shouldn't go. But I'd already said it. Mother had me fetch the big checkbook. When I came back, she tore out a blank check and then handed me a hundred dollar bill she had folded in the side of her wallet. Just the word shopping seemed to made her feel better. Don't be frugal now, and no slacks. Make sure Miss LaBoyle helps you. She rests her head on the on her pillows. She knows how young girls should dress. 
but I couldn't stand the thought of Miss Lavole's wrinkled hands on my body. Smelling of coffee and mothballs, and I drove right through downtown, got on Highway 51, headed for New Orleans. I drove through the guilt of leaving Mother for so long, knowing that Dr. Neal was coming by that afternoon, and Daddy would be home all day with her. Three hours later, I walked into Maison Blanche's department store on Canal Street. I'd seen... I'd been there umpteen times with Mother and twice with Elizabeth and Hilly, but I was mesmerized by the vast white marble floors, the miles of hats and gloves and powdered ladies looking so happy, so healthy. Before I could ask for help, a thin man said, Come with me, I have it all upstairs, and whisked me in the elevator to the third floor to a room called Modern Women's Wear. What is all this? I asked. There were dozens of women and rock and roll playing and champagne glasses and bright glittering lights. Emilio Pucci, darling, finally. He stepped back from me and said, aren't you here for the preview? You do have an invitation, don't you? I'm somewhere, I said, but he lost interest as I faked through my handbag. All around me, clothes looked like they'd sprouted roots and bloomed on their hangers. I thought of Miss Laval and laughed. No Easter egg suits here, flowers, big brass stripes and hemlines that showed several inches of thigh. It was electric and gorgeous and dizzying. This Emilio Pucci character must stick his finger in a socket every morning. I bought with my blank check enough clothes to fill the back seat of the Cadillac. Then on Magazine Street, I paid $45 to have my hair lightened and trimmed and ironed straight. It had grown longer over the winter and was the color of dirty dishwater. By four o'clock, I was driving back over the Lake Ponchachon bridge with the radio playing a band called the Rolling Stones and the wind blowing through my satiny straight hair and I thought tonight I will strip off all this armor and let it be as it was before with Stuart. Stuart and I eat our Chateaubriand smiling talking. He looks off at the other tables commenting on people he knows but no one gets up to tell us hello. Here's to new beginnings, Stuart says and raises his bourbon. I nod sort of wanting to tell him that all beginnings are new. Instead, I smile and toast with my second glass of wine. I've never really liked alcohol until today. After dinner, we walk out on into the lobby and see Senator and Mrs. Whitworth at a table having drinks. People are around them drinking and talking. They're home for the weekend, Stuart told me earlier. They're first since they moved to Washington. Stuart, they're your parents. Should we go say hello? But Stuart steers me toward the door, practically pushes me outside. I don't want Mother to see you in that short dress, he says. I mean, believe me, it looks great on you, but he looks down at the hemline. Maybe that wasn't the best choice for tonight. On the ride home, I think of Elizabeth in her curlers, afraid the bridge club would see me. Why is it that someone always seems to be ashamed of me? By the time we make it back to Longleaf, it's 11 o'clock. I smooth the dress, thinking Stuart is right. It's too short. The light in my parents' bedroom are off, so we sit on the sofa. I rub my eyes and yawn, and when I open them, he's holding the ring between his fingers. Oh, Jesus! I was going to do this at the restaurant, but he grins. Here's better. I touch the ring. It is cold and gorgeous. Three rubies are set on both sides of the diamond. I look up at him, feeling very hot all of a sudden. I pull my sweater off my shoulders. I'm smiling and about to cry at the same time. I have to tell you something, Stuart, I blurt out. Do you promise you won't tell anyone? He stares at me and laughs. Hang on, did you say yes? Yes, but I have, to, I have to know something first. Can I just have your word? He sighs, looks disappointed that I'm ruining his moment. Sure, you have my word. I'm in shock from his proposal, but I do my best to explain. Looking into his eyes, I spread out the facts and what details I can safely share about the book and what I've been doing over the past year. I'll leave out everyone's names and I'll pause at the implication of this knowing it's not good. Even though he's asking to be my husband, I don't know him enough to trust him completely. This is what you've been writing about for the past 12 months? Not, not Jesus Christ? No, Stuart. Not Jesus. When I tell him that Hilly found the Jim Crow laws in my satchel, his chin drops, and I can see that I've confirmed something Hilly already told him about me. Something he had the, na he had the naive, trust, naive trust not to believe. The talk in town. I told them they were dead wrong, but they they were right. When I tell them about the colored maids filing past me after the prayer meeting, I feel a swell of pride over what I've done. He looks down into his empty bourbon glass. 
Then I tell him that the manuscript has been sent to New York, that if they decide to publish it, it would come out in, my guess is, eight months, maybe sooner. Right around the time I think to myself an engagement would turn into a wedding. It's been written anonymously, I say, but with Hilly around, there's still a good chance people know it was me. But he's not nodding his head or pushing my hair behind my ear, and his grandmother's ring is sitting on mother's velvet sofa like some ridiculous metaphor. We're both silent. His eyes don't even meet mine. They stay a steady two inches to the right of my face. After a minute, he says, I, I just, I, I don't understand why you would do this. Why do you even... Why do you even care about this, Skeeter? I bristle and look down at the ring so sharp and shiny. I didn't mean it like that, he starts again. What I mean is, things are fine around here. Why would you want to go stirring up trouble? I can tell in his voice he sincerely wants an answer from me, but how to explain it? He is a good man, Stuart. <coughs> Sorry. And as much as I know that what I've done is right, I still can't understand his confusion and doubt. I'm not making trouble, Stuart. The trouble is already here. But clearly this isn't the answer he is looking for. I don't know you. I looked down remembering that I thought the same thing only moments ago. I guess we'll have the rest of our lives to fix that, I say, trying to smile. I don't, I don't think I can marry somebody I don't know. I suck in a breath. My mouth opens, but I can't say anything for a little while. I had to tell you. I say more to myself than him. You needed to know. He studies me for a few moments. You have my word. I won't tell anyone, he says. And I believe him. He may be many things, but Stuart, but he is not a liar. He stands up, gives me one last long look, and then he picks up the ring and walks out. That night after Stuart has left, I wander from room to room, dry mouth, cold. Cold is what I'd prayed for when Stuart left me the first time, and cold is what I got. At midnight, I hear Mother's voice calling from her bedroom. Eugenia, is that you? <coughs> I walk down the hall, and the door is half open. Mother's sitting up in her starchy white nightgown. Her hair's down around her shoulders, and I'm struck by how beautiful she looks. The back porch light is on, casting a white halo around her entire body. She smiles, and her new dentures are still in, the ones Dr. Simon cast for her when her teeth started eroding from the stomach acid. Her smile's wider even than in her teen pageant pictures. Mama, what can I get you? Is it bad? Come here, Eugenie. I want to tell you something. I go to her quietly. Daddy is a long, sleeping lump, his back to her, and I think I could tell her a better version of tonight. <coughs> Sorry and sorry in my own voice. <laughs> we all know there's very little time. I could make her happy in her last days and pretend that the wedding's gonna happen. I have something to tell you too, I say. Okay, you go first. Stuart proposed, I say, faking a smile, and then I panic, no one shall ask to see the ring. I know, she says. You do? She nods. Of course, he came by here two weeks ago and asked Carlton and me for your hand. Two weeks ago, I almost left. Of course, Mother was the first to know something so important. I'm happy she's had so long to enjoy the news. And I have something to tell you, she says, the glow around Mother's unearthly phosphorus. It's from the porch light, but I wonder why I've never seen it before. She clasps my hand in the air, and the healthy grip of a mother holding her newly engaged daughter. Daddy stirs and sits straight up. What? He gasps. Are you sick? No, Carlton, I'm fine, I told you. He nods numbly, closes his eyes, and is asleep before he has even lain down again. What's your news, Mama? I've had a long talk with your daddy, and I've made a decision. Oh, God, I sigh. I could just see her explaining it to Stuart when he asked for my hand. Is this about the trust fund? No, it's not that, she says, and I think that it must be something about the wedding. I feel a shudder and sadness that Mother will not be here to plan my wedding, not only because she'll be dead, but because there is no wedding. And Anna, I also feel a horrifyingly guilty relief that I won't have to go through with this, with her. Now, I know, I know you've noticed that things have been on the uptick these past few weeks, she says, and I know what Dr. Neal says, that some kind of last strength, some nonsense about, she coughs and her thin body arcs over like a shell give her a tissue and she frowns and dabs at her mouth but as I said I've made a decision I nod 
listening with the same numbness as my father a moment ago. I have decided not to die. Oh, Mama, please, God, please. Too late, she says, waving my hand away. I made my decision and that's it. She slides her palms across each other as if throwing the cancer away, sitting straight, prim in her gown, the halo light glowing around her head. I can't keep from rolling my eyes. How dumb of me. Of course, Mother will be as obstinate about her death as she's been about every detail of her life. The date is Friday, January 17, 1964. I have on a black A-line dress. My fingernails are all bitten off, and I remember every detail of this day. I think the way people are saying they'll never forget what kind of sandwich they were eating or the song on the radio when they found out Kennedy was shot. I walk into what has become such a familiar spot to me, the middle of Abilene's kitchen. It's already dark outside, and the yellow bulb seems very bright. I look at Minnie, and she looks at me, and Abilene edges between us as if to block something. Harper and Roe, I say. They want to publish it. You kidding me? Says Minnie. I spoke to her this afternoon. Abilene lets out a whoop like I've never heard come out of her before. La, I can't believe it, she hollers. And then we hu we, we are hugging Abilene and me, then Minnie and Abilene. Minnie looks in my general direction. Sit down, y'all, Abilene says. Tell me what she say. What we do now? La, I ain't even got no coffee ready. We sit and they both stare at me, leaning forward. Abilene's eyes are big, and I've been wi waiting at home with the news for four hours. Mrs. Stein told me clearly this is a very small deal. Keep our expectations between low and non-existent. I feel obligated to communicate this to Abilene so she doesn't end up disappointed. I've hardly even figured out how I should feel about it myself. Listen, she said not to get too excited that the number of copies are going to be put out is going to be very, very small. I wait for Abilene to frown, but she giggles. She tries to hide it with her hand. Probably only a few thousand copies. Abilene presses her hand harder against her lips. Pathetic, Mrs. Stein called it. Abilene's face is turning darker. She giggles again into her knuckles. Clearly, she is not getting this. And she said it's one of the smallest advances she's ever seen. And I'm trying to be serious as I can, but Abilene is clearly about to burst, and tears are coming up in her eyes. How small, she asked behind her hand. Eight hundred dollars. I say, divided thirteen ways. Abilene splits open in laughter, and I can't help but laugh with her, but it makes no sense. A few thousand copies and sixty-one fifty a person? Tears run down Abilene's face, and finally she just lays her head on the table. I don't know why I'm laughing. It just seems so funny all of a sudden. Minnie rolls her eyes at us. I knew y'all's crazy, both of you. I do my best to tell them the details. I hadn't acted much better on the phone with Mrs. Stein. She sounded so matter-of-fact, almost uninterested. And what did I do? Did I remain businesslike and ask pertinent questions? And did I thank her for taking on such a risky topic? No. Instead of laughing, I start blubbering into the phone, crying like a kid getting a polio shot. Calm down, Miss Fallon, she said. This is hardly going to be a bestseller. But I just kept crying while she fed me the details. We're only offering a $400 advance and then another $400 when it's finished. Are you listening? Yes, yes, ma'am. And there's definitely some editing you have to do. The Sarah section is in the best shape, she said. And I, and I tell Abilene this, though, her fist, through her fists and snorts. Abilene sniffs, wipes her eyes, smiles. We finally calm down, drinking coffee that Minnie had to get up and put on for us. She really likes Gertrude, too, I say to Minnie. I pick up the paper and read the quote. I'd written so I wouldn't forget it. Gertrude is every southern white woman's nightmare. I adore her. <laughs> for a second, Minnie actually looks me in the eye and her face softens into a childlike smile. Did she say that? About me? Abilene laughs. It's like she know you from 500 miles away. She said it'll be at least six months till it comes out, sometime in August. Abilene is still smiling, completely undeterred by anything I've said, and honestly, I'm grateful for this. I knew she'd be excited, but I was afraid she'd be a little disappointed, too. Seeing her makes me realize I'm not disappointed at all. I'm just happy. We sit and talk another few minutes, drinking coffee and tea, until I look at my watch. I told Daddy I'd be home in an hour. Daddy's at home with Mother. I took a risk and left him Abilene's number just in case, telling him I was going to visit a friend named Sarah. 
They both walk me to the door, which is new for many. I tell Abilene I'll call her as soon as I get Mrs. Stein's notes in the mail. So six months from now, we finally gonna know what's happened. Minnie says, good, bad, or nothing. It might be nothing, I say, wondering if anyone will even buy the book. Well, I'm counting on good, Abilene says. Minnie crosses her arms over her chest. I better count on bad then. Somebody got to. Minnie doesn't look worried about book sales. She looks worried about what will happen when the women of Jackson read of what we've written about them. We're going to end there, friends. Thanks for joining me. Make sure you subscribe. Send this to your friends. Get them over here with us. And we'll see you next time on Gina's Book Nook.